Good uh, evening, afternoon, morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Oak Island Research Channel. Some uh, news today. I haven't done a video for a while. Uh, I wanted to thank, of course, John from Quest of Oak Island for hosting us uh, Saturday ago. That was a great experience, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I will be talking today about hydraulic considerations for the volt <clears throat> and some other stories. Uh, the hydraulic on the volt, as per the uh, black and white sketch from Scrolls of Antera, is putting a lot of questions in our comments, uh, both Michael and I. And I would like to share with you what I think how it operates. And it's actually quite simple, I think. Somebody wrote me an email, Ed, w Ed Hyde, sorry, and I wish to thank Ed as he did some pretty thorough calculations on what could be the vault uh, system dimension, shape, and uh, kind of purpose. He comes to think, and I kind of second his thoughts, that inside the vault you have an apparatus that is shaped like a boat with a weight at the bottom to maintain stability uh, based on the buoyancy. Buoyancy gives you a center of thrust and you have the center of gravity of the apparatus. And if the center of thrust is below the center of gravity, you're fine. Otherwise, it starts to be unstable and you would lower the center of gravity by putting weight. That's what we do with boats. So he came up with pretty neat calculation about according to the uh, tides, the uh, displacement of water that would incur and therefore uh, the shape and length needed on the side of that boat to make it uh, float without flood. So I find it very interesting that we, and, I, and I, I'd ask permission to use. Uh, this is what I think the, how the apparatus works. <clears throat> So this is not this is a functional sketch again it is the dimensions are not correct and I'm going to describe you kind of the uh, manual for operation of this apparatus as far as I understand it um, to arm the trap that is and I'm not talking about floating the money pit that's not the trap the trap is to put the whole vault chest and treasure in a higher position not accessible by the service corridor the 45 522 and to 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 let the system and make it out of reach from anybody this is what you have to do you have to you have to wait for high tide slack at the maximum level of the high tide when you got a high tide in the ocean through the ducks from the smith's cove area that would make water go to the money pit. We know there is a seal made of putty, ship putty, as per the 1850 um, report tell us. And this also has got tons of soil and dirt, right, underneath the seal and above. So that would keep the water at a certain level below the charcoal layer. And I'll get back to this at the end of my video. So you get water in the duct, you get water in the money pit, water in the duct again, and water that enters the vault area and continues to the duct and connects back to the ocean somehow. Everything's at high tide level. High tide is determined by that red line here. And at high tide, the seal, of course, is blocking the water from going to the high tide level in the money pit. But inside the vault, the light blue is the extra water brought by the high tide into the system. The hydrostatic law of fluids, uh, as per Blaise Pascal's description, make it understandable, computable, and visioningable. Uh, you can work it out because the theory by Blaise Pascal explains that water pressure is the same across ducts wherever you put yourself in the duct. Uh, this is called the hydrostatic law of water, of fluids. And that's very handy because that's how the apparatus is going to be set up. You open those two valves and you let the high tide, at high tide, this is the configuration you have. So that's instruction white. Instruction one, wait for high tide slack. 
And what you do then, at high tide slack, you would capture the water inside that device, that cylinder, that chamber. How do I capture the water? I lower down both valves. And now anything can happen on the side. I've got capture water with a certain amount of elevation, height of water inside that thing that will stay there because I'm blocking the exit. So the next step is when the water uh, goes down, now how to access the vault, how to bring the apparatus and the boat down. Well, you have to wait for low tide slack. And remember one of my video with the uh, clockfish explains that the etal in French, the slack, is a very important moment in the hydraulic system. So at low tide, where the water is going down, you would still have your high tide extra water in your tank, if you wish, since you locked that tent and tank and isolated it from the rest of the world. So now you have a high pressure of water here that is just asking to exit but it's meeting doors that keeps that under pressure. So your next step, still at low tide slack, is now to open the valve here and let the water flush out because the pressure and the elevation of water here is higher than the ocean. It will self dissolve and push back in the ocean. It will actually make the ocean raise it will make the ocean raise by the volume of water here divided by the volume of the ocean on Earth, a couple of microns maybe, but mechanically and physically it does. So that water here is going to go back so that everything becomes hydrostatic again. Everything comes to the right level. And in that case, the uh, chest will fall on the two pillars with all the water being at the same level. So I was thinking for weeks about what kind of pump is used. I was thinking about venturi pumps. I was thinking about manual water pumps called Archimedes screws, but you don't need all that. And it's not explained on the, on the sketch because it's, the thing is self-sufficient by using the tides as the pump. So that's how I think it works. Finally, once you're done exploring the vault and taking whatever you, you need, you just exit through the corridor, the 45-522 corridor, and raise up La Hampe. And then you would wait for the next high tide cycle, six hours later, gives you plenty of time to have a barbecue. And then what you're gonna do is just open, or sorry, shut down the two uh, valves as per instruction back on step one. And there you go for the cycle again. It's very easy, actually. As, uh, once you get access to the corridor, a single man can do all that, just running around the island for a couple of hours. I mean, if you get to the vault, your maximum waiting time is six hours for having a low tide. And what's interesting is they must have been thinking about um, um, ha, ha, extra, extra high tide. Sometimes uh, tides are higher than other time and that's why they put space in there to allow for more movement and more water if necessary this is a ed hyde sketch when he sent it to me he calculated very smartly just using hydrostatic laws what's the probable depth of the vault uh, and what he he went back to the no o n o o a uh data which is an american uh hydrograph and ocean study uh, entity. And they say in the bay, um, the low tide being zero, you get a, a mean high tide of five to six feet. So that's your mean tide, but you can go up to eight or 10 feet in some occasion and, and, and tides. That's why you would have a higher elevation here. Uh, you would compress air, I think, but air is compressible compared to water. So that wouldn't be so much of a problem, but yeah, you would have compressed air there, but that's how the, the vault would go up and down with enough provisioning for all sorts of tides. And thinking about the location of the vault, we suppose at the bottom of the footstone of the endstone, as per Michael's work and mine, 
is, according to Ed, a 22 feet elevation from the ocean. We know that the tide goes up to around 32 feet, so basically plus or minus 10 feet to cover over the vault, and there you are. We, the, the vault, as per this mechanical explanation, uh, is not very low. Otherwise, if it was lower than this, the extra water from the high tide would, would go all the way to the top here. You get a mechanical limit, which is the elevation of the tide. The elevation of the tide, you need to place your cylinder so that you get room, <clears throat> sorry, so, so that you get room there. So contrary to what I thought originally, that this was buried way under the bedrock, it's actually not. It's, it's probably quite close to the surface. And you remember, I, I, I read a long time ago in several books and reports, people mentioning noises, that this island was making sounds. And that could be the sound of a uh, low tide with a high tide coefficient. You get a high tide coefficient, that's how fast the water moves. And if you get a high tide coefficient, that thing could almost fall on those pillars, making that noise resonating with the chamber. And if you're only 10 feet or 15 feet down the surface, it would vibrate and you could hear it on the island. And I was chasing that hint, that trail originally about the sound that I remember people reported hearing on the island. <clears throat> and uh, that, that, that trail led me somewhere. I'm going to show you. But just before that, sorry, just before that, I want to give a framework about how much we knew on hydraulics law throughout the ages. <clears throat> because in order to design this system, you need to understand the physics and the mechanics that are going to drive the uh, behavior <clears throat> of what you are trying to build. So you need to plan it. And in order to plan it, you need to have a theory to plan it against. I'm not saying, especially in those days, that um, theorists were the first one to discover something. Sailors knew very much about water, buoyancies, and things floating and not floating. Uh, people may have pragmatically used science fact without knowing them until somebody created a theory out of it. So let's have a look quickly. Uh, Archimedes, Archimed, explained and, and created, and, and not created, but discovered the buoyancy flotability laws, allowing humankind to manufacture boats and knowing before manufacturing it if it was going to float or not. That's, that's what the theory is about. Leonardo da Vinci uh, didn't make that many breakthroughs in hydraulics, but refined the Archimedes screw, for instance, a water screw. He, he made a more efficient one. Bellow pumps, you can look that on Google. You're pushing air into a duct, and this way, you're going to push the water that's in the duct at the same time, etc., etc. In order to <clears throat> plan, execute, create, envision the hydraulic system underneath the, underneath the island, you need to refer to hydrostatic law. You need to understand that the water level of water in ducts and anywhere is the same, or it will incur pressure. Uh, and this type of knowledge was only known definitely by Blaise Pascal, who, 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 who is the founder of uh, the basic law of hydrostatic. is the one who put down that pressure equals force divided by surface area on which the pressure is, exer is exerted. So you need to wait a bit of Newton to understand reciprocal laws. And some of Blaise Pascal, or just before, let's say, that those sailors may have understood all that before those theorists back in mainland Europe demonstrated. Nevertheless, we are using some concepts that dates from roughly 1600, and that matches most of the things we found uh, about many things. That period, 1600-1650, is a high suspect for uh, <clears throat> is a usual suspect is a high suspect. For, for the uh, construction of the of the apparatus. So that would work, right? Later, uh, we get Bernoulli and those guys and what I call modern hydraulics. That's where you start to have Bernoulli, Venturi's law, Venturi's pump, able from a stream to um, put a negative pressure on a perpendicular duct and sucking, 
some of that pressure. Pytode for the pytode tube that we still use in aircraft to measure speed. Uh, all, all that come from the Bernoulli, but that's a bit late, I think, because let's remember all this was in place in 1795 and of course a bit earlier. So I think 1600, you, you have to wait for Blaise Pascal to uh, engineer and envision such a concept, I think. So I wouldn't bet earlier than 1570 or 1600. Uh, I mean, Blaise Pascal in 1623 just got born. He didn't come up with the theory until 1650, basically. And that could be the age at which this thing was designed, late 1650, 1670. But putting back into the historical concept helps understanding what was at hand when they designed that thing. Another thing I, I want to tell you is that, um, did I mention, <laughs> I didn't, I forgot. Here, the first slide. Proposal for the model ship by Ed Hyde, the fancy. I call this model ship, the fancy. And the reason why I call it the fancy is that I came up to a trail of hints or something very strange I'm going to share with you. This poem uh, supposedly was composed by Captain Henry Avery, who according to a, let's call him a researcher, uh, a theorist, uh, was part of the engineering of the money pit system with Captain Kidd. Okay, that's his point of view. But what's very interesting is when you read some of the rhymes and verses of this poem, and I singled out some for you, I'll put the URL, or you can just wiki source, you know, you can find it on yourself. Let's read a couple of the three, the three uh, verses. Come all you brave boys whose courage is bold, will you venture with me, I'll glut you with gold. Make haste unto Corona, a ship you will find, that's called the Fancy, will pleasure your mind. It's a poem about a ship called the Fancy. Let's read a bit more. Her model is like wax and she sails like the wind. She's rigged and fit and curiously trimmed. And all things convenient has for his design. God bless this poor Fancy. She's bound for the mine. Let's reread this. We're talking about a ship, the model is like wax. Like if you had a small model ship in that vault with a lot of clay around it, that would look like wax. She's rigged and fit and curiously trimmed. Yes, she is for a ship. God bless the poor fancy, she's bound for the mine. Wow, she's bound to go underground in the mine tunnel system. Let's look at the last it's, it's one of the last verses. No quarter to give, no quarter to take. We save nothing living at us this too late. For we are not sworn by the bread and wine. More serious we are than any divine. For we are now sworn by the bread and wine. Bread and wine refers to uh, <clears throat> Christianism, doesn't it? <clears throat> it's like if they were sworn by, by the uh, flesh and the blood of Jesus. Uh, and they say, it's not about money. It's about something else that we're with. And I mean, I found it, um, it's it's just a crazy hint, you know, but I find it very interesting with the context we are now putting on the table about that ship floating up and down in that vault. And it must be uh, pretty reinforced to last for hundreds of years against some water, salted water. So they must have covered it with clay called the wax, maybe. And she's curiously trained for a ship. And she's bound for the mine. So I, I found it very interesting. And who put me on that lead? Well, <clears throat> I came to this very, very old forum. Old because nobody has posted on this since 2011 or 2012, when the show started somehow. And it was called oakislandtreasure.co.uk. And there's hundreds of pages, and I was kind of bored, I guess, this weekend. I just went through all the pages looking for interesting things, and I found this. That's the URL. I'll give it on my uh, on, on the video <coughs> uh, um, main page. There's somebody called KGT Kid who was posting quite some posts. And that guy is 
anything but humble. Uh, he claims he knows the thing. He claims he, he went to talk with uh, uh, Dan uh, uh, Blackenship and then Fred Nolan and exposed the theory. He went there many times. He knows everything. And he's very, very arrogant, which is something strange for a Frenchman to say, about I know, I know, I know. So maybe he knows, but he's not humble about it for sure. He gives a lot of detail in some many posts of the forum, and some of them just caught my attention. That person says, I'm the only one, but let's leave that only one for the side. We can tell you how the subterranean system was constructed, how it could have been activated, flooded, and protected by one man very quickly if it was required. Well, KGT kid, we do too now. We are not the only one anymore. We know how it was constructed, more or less, must admit. But how it can be activated, flooded, or protected by one and very quickly, very quickly, six hours. I need a tide if it was required. So that we know too. But it seems he knew too. How did the treasure and its approximation location within a specific area? We do too. Thanks to Michael's job, we can locate where the vault is, and thanks to Ed Hyde's proposal on the hydraulic study, we know how deep it is. But he knew that too somehow, or he claims he did. I know just below the topsoil is the location of a secret road used to support wagon loads of treasure in the land. Well, we do too, we watch the show. And what's incredible is not that we know, because the show explains how we got to that, is how do you know there was a road there? He claims also he knows the location of a concealed loading shaft that connects to a secret access tunnel to leading the repository of the accumulated treasure. We do too. That's what we call the 45-522 shaft, service shaft. And that's the concealed loading shaft that connects to the secret access to the tunnel, which is the corridor and you go to the vault. We know that because we've been working six months of this, because we've got the La Rochefoucauld document, because we've got all the things and Michael's work and the decoding. We know that now. How does he know that? He's been following our videos, maybe. And he claims he knows why coconut fiber and charcoal were discovered in the money pit. I'm going to tell you in a second that so that we know why the charcoal was discovered. It's not just about a mark on the 40 foot fit, on the 40 foot uh, place to dig. So that gentleman obviously follows the show and follows our channel and just claims he knows everything based on this. Well, not at all, because that's the most intriguing part. All this was written in 2011. It was written before our videos, of course. It was written before the Zina Halpern's document came out. It was written before the scrolls of Ontario were published in 2017. So I found it very intriguing that this gentleman, who, who had a forum himself, that nothing's there anymore, he, he removed everything, and he, the forum here, the Oak Island Treasure one, he doesn't post anymore, nobody does. But I traced that, and he's just kind of describing what we're onto, but he knew that already in 2011. And people were mocking him, you know, saying, you can't prove your thing, blah, blah, and he said, no, I can't talk about it until I got a contract, because this is so important, this is a solution. Is British, so I'm not sure he decoded La Rochefoucauld map like we did, because that is fluent French speaking. He may have other document and other information, but what he claims, he knows, and is the only one to know, well, we all know now because of the video and Michael's job and stuff. And incredible, that was that was written in 2011. Again, I'll put that URL in the uh, in in the body of the of the video so you can access it. Incredible. And that's the guy who, who, who led me to the poem uh, that we just show here. So very interesting. And finally, <clears throat> I want to I want to maybe uh, I read his, 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 his remarks, his comment, his threads, and there may be something there. The charcoal. So so we discovered the charcoal was the mark for the 40 foot place where you should start to look for a side door or a side hide or something through what the report says hard clay, and they insisted on hard clay, where they found uh, pickaxe marks. This is clay with water, muddy clay. That's the clay you would find in a swamp, in on an island that's got water everywhere. That's, that, that wouldn't stand 
up, right? And this is cooked clay through a furnace, 200 degrees Celsius, 430 Fahrenheit, roughly. And that you can make a wall with, but you need to cook it. How would you cook that? Well, you would make a fire. You would make a fire, and because of the dimension, this is a real chimney, it would quickly go very high in temperature and would cook your walls of soft clay and almost liquid clay, muddy clay. It would quickly, quite quickly because of the heat that would generate a fire here at this level, that would create your hot clay and you could hide easily a wooden door or something like that behind. And by picking with axis on that, you would probably discover the surrounding of that door or trap and enter through here. Why at this distance? Because you don't need to make hot clay anywhere below. You need to, why is the hot clay? To conceal the entrance of the 45-522 corridor, that's all. The hot clay is there to, of course, reinforce the shaft itself, but then you're not supposed to dig any further. So we don't care, we don't need any more hot clay. It should stop here. And that's right where the charcoal was found. Uh, coincidentally, it's, it's used for two purposes. It's used first to reinforce the hard clay, but since you don't need you don't need to do it below your mark of the door, it also shows you the mark of the door. So I think in the instruction set from the uh, documents uh, uh, that were found in the scroll of Vantera describing uh, all the underground system, there were French instructions, but we we only get one, two, three, four, five, and we're missing quite a number because there's a thirtieth last one. Uh, that exists. So we're missing 24 pieces and steps. And I bet that one of those steps is at one point that if you enter the system and you exit, you're going to close that trap door, wood door, whatever it is. You need to put some clay in there. And, and again, you need to cook it so that for the next 10 years or 20 years, um, it's just hidden again. So you would need to remake a fire there, a small one maybe because you would only a couple of meter of soft clay to become hard, but I'm pretty sure that's part of the following instruction. I always wondered, why is there a gap between five and 30? Why do you need 24 instructions? You already, you're in there. You, you, you mastered the system, you remove the water, you enter, okay, goodbye, maybe seven instruction. Why do you need 23 more? Because you need to hide uh, all the steps you went through and you need to conceal your, your, your forfeit. Voilà, many things today. It's a bit longer video. I thought you, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, talk to you soon for more adventures. But this is this is getting interesting again. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care.